Hello and welcome to the Women at the Top podcast. Today we're going to be interviewing an author as part of our ongoing series. My name is Regina Barr and I'm the founder of Women at the Top Network and I'll be your host today. Joining me today is author Becky Amble and I'm very excited to have her here with us. She is an author of more than 10 books, 150 articles, and 250 videos. And all I can say to that is, wow. And Becky is a thought leader in business and industry. And for over 30 years, she has worked with businesses who want to increase revenue and profits. And who doesn't want to do more of that? Now, Becky shows them how to use AI as a tool to save time, save money, and improve performance. So with that, I want to welcome Becky to our podcast today. Thanks. Great to be with you, Regina. Well, I'm very excited. Uh, you and I have had the occasion to talk uh, previously, and um, I've had the opportunity to take a look at your book. So I want to start with that. First of all, this is a very timely topic. I'm sure you're getting lots and lots of questions about this and about your book. So tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write Mastering ChatGPT for Women. Well, it started when I'm in a mastermind group and our leader basically was going to talk about ChatGPT. And I thought, oh, great. One more thing I got to learn. Don't I have enough to do right now? So I started out with this bad attitude, which isn't typical of me. Anyway, then he actually did a demo and I thought, oh my gosh, I have got to do this. So then I set up my account that same day and I just started asking ChatGPT questions and I was just like going to town, going to use it. Well, then as I continued on, I've trained with three, dif three different organizations. And at one point, I decided people kept asking me why I wasn't helping people with it. And I said, well, I work on strategy and AI is more tactical. And then I thought, well, if that's where people need help, because you can use it to get to strategy and to grow your business, I thought, all right, let's just do that. And as I thought more about it, obviously, being a strategy person, I also think about target markets. And I decided that a lot of times women, I think, are more prone to negative self-talk. And um, we discount our abilities. And sometimes, because there is a smaller representation of women in technology, sometimes women think that technical things are, I don't know, challenging. They don't want to mess with them, whatever. And I had my own attitude of, I have too much to do now. Don't add one more thing to my equation. So I just started feeling like, you know, I want to do a book specifically for women. I'm a woman. I'm writing it for women. And I want to just give women tools and say, just go for it. This is something that you can do, anybody can do, and give them some tips and tricks and just play it out and say, go for it. Because I think we all can use this as a tool if we decide to. I think that's a great point. It's interesting. I was working with a client last September and had hired someone to help with some of the event tactical pieces, if you will. And she wrote something. Um, I asked her just to take a stab at drafting something, and then I would review it and edit it. And so she said, okay, full disclosure, I was running out of time. I hope you don't mind, but I ran it into chat GBT and um, whatever. And she sent something over to me. And it wasn't quite the flavor but what was nice about it, it was a starting point. And that kind of, for me, was like, okay, you know, maybe there is a place to use this. And hopefully as we go along today, others will find maybe some places where they can use it. Because Lord knows we all need to be more efficient with our time and getting things done. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about, um, I don't think things would easily intimidate you, Becky, just because I've known you for years and I see some of the work that you do. But I think for some people, navigating the world of AI can be intimidating. So can you tell us a little bit about how the text AI actually works and maybe some key applications for text AI that people could try? Sure. Well, first, let me tell you the top five things that small business owners, in particular, small business owners who are women, how they are most using it. And I can explain these a little bit as well, but I'll just tell you what they are. And if you say, well, do you have like 
sentence about each, I can do that. So automating customer support is one of the top five. Streamlining administrative tax, tasks is also. Facilitating collaboration. A fourth point is generating content. And then the fifth point is research and analysis. And um, I can give you a little more detail on each of those if you want, or we can start talking about what is AI, how do you use it? So I'm going to have you jump to streamline admin tasks. And the reason is I pick a word sometimes each year, you know, I try to pick a word and my word this year for myself is streamline and simplify. So as soon as you said that, that kind of, and I, I would hazard a guess that most women, especially those in corporate who have any other kind of life outside of corporate, um, would be interested in that. So tell us a little bit more about that before you jump into sure. how it actually works. Sure. Well, there are a lot of things going on in the AI world now. And I spend a lot of time talking about chat GPT because that's the big player out there. There are some new things that I won't quite get into all the detail that people want to keep your ears open. And the key word is agent. Another key word is co-pilot. But agent is really going to be exciting. And that's a little bit newer technology. There's still some things that need to be worked out. An agent is basically where you would go. You'd find whatever the website is. Um, and there are a number of them now that are working on that. You would go to that website and you would type in and you would say to this thing that's called an agent, you would say, I want you to look at my tasks and create a new workflow for me and it will actually do the work for you. So the cool thing about agents is you can describe, you can tell them things and it does the work where when we're dealing with chat GPT or any of the other text AIs, you ask them a question and they come back with answers and information. An agent or a co-pilot, the co-pilots aren't as developed as the agents are going to be, they will actually do it for you, which is like, sign me up. I want that right now. Anyway, in the meantime, you can use the AI text image um, services, and that's what we refer to when we talk to ch about chat GPT. So people might not realize that there is a thing. It's text, it's audio, it's video. There's different buckets. And so chat GPT is a text. Bard, now called Gemini, is a text. Bing now is Microsoft. That's a text. And Klon, which now has a bunch of money from Amazon, those all deal with text. So what that means is we type in or we talk and it comes back with words. It's text versus producing an audio or video. So just so people understand that there's a little distinction. So what I would do to streamline my tasks, there's a couple of different things you could do. You could identify, and this takes a little homework on all of our part, you could identify the key things that you spend your time on. And you could ask it for some feedback. And you could ask it, which of these are going to be easier to hand off, to streamline, to automate? You could ask that. There's also different things like, oh, oh gosh. Z oh, shoot, I'm forgetting the name. Xander. No, that's our. Well, anyway, there's other automation tools out there that integrate with artificial intelligence, but they're still different. So some of those might actually be an answer. Anyway, I would do that. The other thing you can do is you can even say, here's my typical day. How can I streamline this? What are some ideas? What are some tools? So you can identify something. And if you say a big thing is scheduling phone calls, for example, you can go to chat GPT or any of the other text ones. And you can say, I want to have a tool that's going to help me do this. What are they? And how do I set it up? You just keep asking your questions. Yeah, you just keep asking and asking and asking. It's like having a human assistant and you would probably ask these questions over and over or in more detail. You get a piece and then you go, oh, what about this? And then they answer and you go, well, then what about the next step? Like peeling back an onion. Just keep peeling yeah. away, peeling yeah. away, peeling away. Well, I like that. I mean, um, makes it sound really easy. Uh, but I do want to turn to some of the concerns I think that people might have about um, chat GPT or AI in general. 
So I do feel like some people are resisting it. There is some fear or concern that AI may have some biases and there are some that might even say it doesn't have a great reputation now. So what are some of the challenges and or the limitations in implementing a text AI system? Is there anything yeah. you can share with us on that? Yes, good question. And I've got 10 of them. We probably don't want to talk about all of them. One of the things is to recognize there's a, another term out there that people want to pay attention to, and it's called human in the loop, H-I-T-L. And a big part of that is to remember that we are dealing with a machine, and it is not human. So even when we type in our prompt, the directions that we give, whichever AI we're using, we type in our little directions, or you know, you can talk to it now, uh, at least when you're on your phone, is it'll have you, it might automatically do some typo corrections, or it might not. There's things you can add to it that will check your typos. Well, the other thing that happens is it might change the word, and it thinks it's a typo. So you have to go back and you have to make sure that your prompt, your question, your order that you're giving it still makes sense. So there's that. And then when you get information back, you need to be able to make sure that that makes sense. I usually tell people, at least when you're starting, ask ChatGPT, if you're using that or any of them, use it and ask questions that you already know the answers to. And you're going to ask it that that will help you tweak it or put some pieces together or whatever it is that your ultimate goal is. And then look at it and say, oh yeah, that's correct. That makes sense. Because I first my first um, chat was to ask it about benchmarking. And I used to do workshops on benchmarking. So I type in something about explain benchmarking to me. Well, it came back and I'm like, that's not right. So I trot over to my engineer husband. I go, look at this. This is more like what you would call benchmarking for engineers. And he goes, yeah, but like what's wrong with you? Of course. And I said, well, that's not what I teach when I'm teaching benchmarking for businesses. So then I go back, trot back and I go something about give me the principles for benchmarking in the business environment, et cetera. And then it came back and I'm like, yeah, now we're talking. You got it. So use that human in the loop idea that, remember, it's not human. It's not going to have emotion. It's not going to be good at self-reflection. It's probably not going to be good at personalizing things. It's, it's doing a lot better, but there's stuff it just can't do. And then you touched on the whole bias is most people have some understanding now probably of AI. And the way the text bots were created is they are given a ton of information. I always say, think of it as somebody that has read every book, every PDF, heard every lecture, watched every video, all that stuff. So these, um, they're actually called bots, chat bots, have a ton of information, but they don't have a filter that says, this is accurate. This is not accurate. This is biased. This is slanted, one-sided. So that's again, where you really need to look at it because you don't know exactly where the information comes from. The other thing that you can do that's getting better now is to ask it where it got the information from. And sometimes it'll tell you, sometimes it won't. It kind of depends how you set it up. But I find that's also a good thing to do. And then if you need to verify, you now have the reference. And you can go do uh, like a Google search or a DuckDuckGo and yeah, confirm that the information is accurate. Well, I think that's great advice because you should always know the source of the data is when you're using it. I always like to know where the source comes from. And I I have trained myself to be very good about citing sources because I never want to use a source and not give credit to that. Well, I'm going to move us right. along um, sure. just in the interest of time. So yeah. let's say you've intrigued us. And those listening in or watching are ready to take the next step and they want to make that leap to using ChatGPT. So we want to know more about where to start. So can you tell us um, what you suggest? I mean, you've given us some ideas about tools. You've given us some ideas, test something that you know so that you feel confident with, with the data that you're getting back and can, can tweak it. Um, what do you just say to people, just jump in, just try something. What? Well, almost, 
almost, I would say, start with the text, artificial intelligence. And that, again, is going to be ChatGPT. And I say ChatGPT because it's been the leader and the first one out there and all kinds of crazy statistics. I believe it was in December or January, they had over 1 billion searches. Yeah. Yeah. It's just gotten crazy. Now, depending on what you're going to do, you have to make some choices. So the four main ones, and I heard one place say there's over 12,000 tools now, and then I heard somebody else say, no, those are, there's over 300,000. <laughs> so I don't care if there's 12,000. That's still too many to try to figure out. Yes. And I get some newsletters that, frankly, make my eyes glaze over, so I don't want to throw those out to people because that can just really throw you into overwhelm. Anyway, so I would look at ChatGPT. I would look at Bing, which is now the Microsoft and it might show up as Microsoft Copilot. You can still usually Google Bing AI and get it. That um, ties into ChatGPT4, which you have to pay for ChatGPT4 if you go directly to OpenAI. Um, the 3.5 is still free. So you can actually get a newer upgraded version of ChatGPT if you go to Bing. Now, the problem there is I just don't really like the way Bing works. <laughs> And so, you know, you just a little caution if you're going to try being, yeah. right, you know, yeah, Who knows? I go, somebody else might love it. So it's good to yeah. try. So I'd go play around with it, see what you like. The other one is Claude. Well, one of the other ones, Claude, and that's put out by a company called Anthropic, Anthropic. But again, if you just do Claude or Claude AI on a search, you'll find it. And then the last one is Bard, which is now been changed to a name. Gemini, and that's the Google product. So they all have different things. Now, one of the pluses with Bing is because they put money into ChatGPT, they will also get you the the visual, and that's called Dolly, D-A-L-L -L, capital E. So you can get that for free through Bing. Um, I was working on one of my books, Love from Grandma, and I'm putting in some new images because it was printed the old-fashioned way. So now we got to redo everything. And I was looking for images, and I went to Gemini, which will give you text, words, and they also have an image generator. So I actually found some of the images really great on that. And I only mentioned the images because it's relatively simple. So if you're doing the text um, bots... And let's say that, well, like today I sent out an email and I needed a cover of the new book. Well, I already have that. But let's say that I wanted to have a picture of springtime. Well, then you might go to one of the bots and say, hey, make me a picture of flowers. I like daffodils and narcissus because they grow here and crocus or whatever. And put a little flower garden together. Well, then there you go. You got your image generator for doing something. So again, Claude. Gemini, Microsoft Copilot, or Bing it, and then ChatGPT. So one of my questions would be, are there any areas where we should be cautious? Like I have heard, and I, I've not vetted this out, but that if you are generating content through ChatGPT for a blog or a website, that Google actually can tell that it's been generated by a blog or, excuse me, that it's been generated by AI and that that content is going to get a lower Google ranking in their algorithm or something like that. Um, thoughts on that? Or yep, yep, that's any... also an excellent question. And one of the things, again, back to that term that I said, human in the loop, which I'm not sure if a lot of people know that one yet, is when you get something back from any of these that is in written form, you want to put your spin or your flavor, your personality on it. So that's a key thing to do. I use, because of all of my book writing, I use Grammarly and they have a plagiarism checker. And I was just checking on, um, I actually uploaded one of my books and I said, because, you know, it's 170 pages of content that took me probably close to 200 hours. And I'm thinking, what can I do with this? Well, I'm speaking to my military group and I said, boy, I'd really like to give them an ebook. So I went to Claude, which is the best one for this. And I said, can you rewrite this? My book, here's the whole thing. Um, I took out all the images and, you know, there's some technical stuff. 
Anyway, so I gave it to Claude and I said, can you rewrite this in military with their jargon and et cetera, et cetera. And so that was a slow process, but that took a week. But that's some of the stuff that you can do. Now, and the reason I use Claude is because it's good at that. The other thing is Claude is supposed to be secure and not share your information. On any of the other ones, you don't want to ever put like your name or anything too personal. Like let's say that you were job hunting and you wanted a critique of your resume. Take your name off. Take off anything that might be too easily identifiable. Um, there's some stuff you can do on ChatGPT now in creating your own GPT. The word is still out. Some people are saying it's secure. Some say it isn't. So I would still be cautious and take out anything that would identify you with your name or an address or anything that gets too personal. And just be astute. And like I said, really go back into anything that you get generated and figure out, okay, you know, how much do I tweak this? What makes it my sound more like me? And then you should be okay. Oh, and the other thing, I forget, there was something like they did a computer test and there was something like 95%, I think it was, of text generated by ChatGPT passed through without being identified as computer generated. Okay. So I want to do a follow-up question when you talked about the example you gave for the cover of your book with, hey, create a garden picture with crocus and daffodils and whatever so it comes back with an image who owns the image do you own the image no is it okay so who owns that image how does that work if you're going to use something well how do you source it yeah what i do is i give attributions because usually i'm using dolly now i'm using gemini a little bit i've used um another one called my mid journey and another one called leonardo but for anybody here starting out gemini and dolly are way simpler just use those. And I would just do an attribution. Like uh, if I put a LinkedIn post on and I'm using AI and I said, hey, here's my story. Here's the key points. Usually if I'm using it, I practically dictate everything to it. And then I say, put it together or make it flow or something. Um, and then if I'm using an image, I will cite that source. Just like if I use Unsplash. Give me an example. Those. How would you cite it? Oh, just I would like on the one book that I'm working on now, uh, it's great because I'm doing it in Pages, which is a, an Apple product. And when I paste in the photo, it asks for a caption. So all I do is image created by Dolly or Gemini. And okay. again, if you're putting a post on LinkedIn at the top or the bottom of where the image is, I would again put something like image created by and cite where it is, just like you would if you were using Unsplash. Is it Un or yeah. Unsplash? Whichever. You know, yeah. try to attrib give attributions because in the visual world, copyright gets a little bit picky and nasty. Mm -hmm. We want to give credit to artists and other things. And I think that's a little bit of what my concern is, like, is chat GPT or the ones that do the images, are they pulling from other images that may be copyrighted? So that's why I'm asking who actually owns and how do you source? Because I think... Uh, you know, we don't want to get into a copyright situation or do something that might be unethical just because we don't know, right? So I think that's some great examples that you have there. Yeah. So I'm going to shift our um, conversation again. And you had talked a little bit earlier about using uh, chat GPT for content and research. So how can a business leverage AI our content and research in brief, if you. Yes, I will try to be brief because that could take a whole day. Um, first of all, I would say to anybody is figure out what your goal is for your content and then figure out your themes. Like I talk with a lot of people and I say, okay, come up with three things you know really well, then do three branches of those three. Now you already got nine topics um, that you can talk about. So get real clear on what it is that you want to be doing first, which would be the case of any content. And just because we have AI doesn't mean that we're just going to go wild and create a bunch of stuff. Still make sure you have a point that you're trying to make and that you're being consistent. Um, so what I do a lot of times is I will I will read something. Like I love penguins. So just as an example, I read about penguins and how unique they are and that they're not a flying bird, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't know, I think everybody likes penguins. They're kind of cool little creatures. I so, do. I took this information, I took some place, 
uh, some information from a source that had stories, inf- well, not stories, information about penguins. And I said, I want to create a post that talks about differentiation and, and illustrate how being a penguin and being different is their strength and how a business can use something that they are different and turn it into a strength and da 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 And so I dictated all this stuff and I said, put that into something. Give me a LinkedIn post. Oh, the other thing that's really important is when you're doing anything, give it the the directions of who they are. And what I mean by that is tell it, you are an expert on LinkedIn posts. Create a, and then you tell it what you want. If you say you are an expert on promotion and I want my LinkedIn post to be promotional and, and grab people's attention, give it those directions up front about what the expert is or the voice that you're coming from and set as much of the context as you can, kind of the background of the story. So you're setting the stage like you would if you were in theater and you have to set up a whole background. And um, so that's how I use it a lot. I think, again, you can take something that you wrote. I do this also, where I take something I write and I go, you know, can you tweak this? What, What suggestions do you have? And I might say, Make it more engaging, make it more formal, make it less formal. Those are all things that you can do. My one piece of advice, and uh, I think you would probably concur, is start with something small. Like You don't have to start with a book. Um, you could start with uh, write a thank you note for whatever purpose or write a short memo on a particular topic or you know something that's a little bit smaller, a little more discreet. Uh, and play with it. So absolutely. Yes. I've used it a lot for volunteer things where I think I don't have time like this case to write a thank you note, or I don't have time to tell the people in my grant program that they didn't receive a grant. So again, I'll go back and I'll dictate a whole bunch of stuff and I'll say, write me one. And then you look at it and you can say, write me five more or change, right. You know, change it this way, that way. I mean, and sometimes at that point, um, and I did do that for a note uh, for a nonprofit that I was working with. At that point, I always tell people it's easier to be an editor than if you're creating it from scratch. So from there, sometimes you can just take it and tweak it yourself the old fashioned way. But that's just me. So I do want to shift our conversation in the time that we have left, Becky, because I know we could go all day here. But I I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't ask this question that there's talk that AI will replace humans in the workplace. And what do you think about that? Do you think AI is going to replace people in jobs or what? Mostly not. A number of years ago, I was working as a futurist and speaking a lot. And then I decided working with my clients directly on growth strategies was really what I enjoyed the most. So I I stopped reading the four newspapers a day and all of that. We talked about all of this stuff like 40 years ago. And said, now some of this is coming together. We talked about PDAs, a personal um, device. Well, that's turned into our cell phone. Um, So I think where it will replace people is more will replace functions and tasks because it's really good at saving time and doing some of those repetitive things. I think the good jobs are going to be for people that know AI and can use it. Those are going to, at least right now, for sure, those are the top jobs. And I look at it and I go, for years, I've said, why aren't we making robots to go in the coal lines? Why aren't we making machines for jobs that are really dangerous? Well, that's not necessarily AI, but darn near. And so I think what will happen is people will just figure out what are some lower skill tasks that I can automate because we're already doing automation. What are some skills or some things where I can use some help and I don't need to hire somebody separate. Maybe you don't even have anybody now. And so you're just uh, really amplifying or making what you're doing better. That's great. I think that's great advice. So we are actually winding down on time. I know it's hard to believe the time goes quick. But if you had just one piece of advice that you could share with our listeners or those watching today, when it comes to using chat GPT, what would it be? Well, I thought I had one, kind of two. I would say get engaged, try it out, 
Maybe there's some things that you need to do to learn some basics. There's different ways that you can do that. Uh, so I would just try it out and learn what you can and then decide, what is it going to do for me? Because not everybody's going to use it or use it the same way. And I just say, learn everything you can and then decide how to use it. And I would also, just the other pieces, keep that human in the loop. Remember, it's a machine and we're still the human. We still are driving the boat and uh, running the show here. As a dog owner, we are the alpha dogs. <laughs> I always tell my husband, I'm the alpha dog in our house with our dog and whatnot. So, well, that's all we have time for today. I want to say thank you so much for being with us here today, Becky. This was a fabulous conversation on a great topic. And, you know, I would love to bring you back at another time and kind of see where things have gone and talk more about your book. So a big thank you also to our viewers and listeners for joining us today. See you all next time.